am going to present you to some amazing Roman women. Um, and although they lived 2,000 years ago, I think they still have something really amazing to bring. Um, and I want to start with a story, more of a personal story. And that is, when I was 12 years old, I heard someone say on TV that in our lifetimes, we all inhale at least one molecule of everyone who has ever lived on this planet Earth before us. And he was speaking about Julius Caesar, and at the time, he didn't, it didn't even ring a bell to me, but my mind was wandering to, I know, the Egyptian pharaoh, Tutankhamun, and to Martin Luther King, who I'm just, I had just seen a snippet of his I Have a Dream speech, and I was mesmerized. I felt as if they lived inside of me a little bit, one molecule at a time, and it felt like through osmosis, I sort of took them with me on my journey through life. And then, actually, what I find amazing, and it's just a side note, that in my 12-year-old brain, I didn't think of all the shitty people who has inhabited the planet as well. <laughs> no, only the amazing leaders and inspiring people came to mind. And actually, 10 years later, it led me via a very long and rather depressing teenage years <laughs> and a long road to studying history. And there, when I, studied, when I started studying history, I realized something, that the role models that I had brought with me over the years had all been male role models. And I had always felt as if I couldn't live up because you see, when I was 12 years old, my dream was to be a professional soccer player. But I was a girl, and in that era, there were no professional female soccer players. And the moment that my body unambiguously let me know I was going to be a woman, <laughs> my dreams shattered. And I actually felt silly, because I was one of the best soccer players, better than the boys but I didn't have a chance to sort of live out my dream. And there in uni, I started to realize what was wrong. I didn't have that much female role models. And there on the pages of the handbooks, in the boxes, you know, sort of the inserts, not in the main text, there were boxes about women and other minorities. But for me, the women stood out and I was fascinated. And I thought, I really want to learn more. And not only about the women, but I had another insight. I didn't only want to dedicate myself to these women. I wanted to dedicate myself to history. Because you see, when you learn about history, and I hope you will take this with you for today, because I realize we all have different backgrounds. And some of you won't connect with these Roman women. But if we share our history, if we connect to our history and our enormous legacy, we not only have new insights about ourselves, but about our families, about our communities, and about the world at large. And we can bring that forward into the future and bridge some gaps they are, that are, there are. And we can let them sort of fill our shoes and we can stand on the shoulders of giants and feel empowered. So there I was in uni and I, university, and I thought I really want to do something with these women, but actually there aren't many sources when you are a Roman, when you are an historian in general, and certainly not a Roman historian, not a lot of sources about women. Because you see, not only were the authors of the ancient text, and text in general, mainly men, but also the transition and transmission over the centuries and the editing of the text, and even the researches of the last couple of hundred years, of course, had been male. So both the sources and the research had been male-dominated. But I was lucky, because when I was studying 
some of the few specialists on female historic leadership came to my university, and I was really beyond excited. Although I have to admit to something, I was a little bit worried as well, because she was a Roman historian, and at that time I was only focusing on women of the last couple of centuries, and I thought, what? For crying out loud, can we learn about women 2,000 years ago and their roles when well, we are actually still trying to carve out our own spaces in our era nowadays? What can we learn from them? Well, and I have to admit, and I hope you agree with me, we can actually learn a lot from them. And I want to share right up front the three things I nowadays think we can all learn from, from these women, and then I'm going to introduce you to some of them. But the three main points that sort of um, come uh, out of my research are the following three. First of all, if it wants to work, yes. First of all, these women 2,000 years ago who were so much more limited legally uh, and by social stereotype than we often are nowadays, certainly here in the West, they had a really daring and innovative way of dealing with these limitations and dealing with these social ideals. And I'm going to show you how. The second part is that they were, and I think that's one of the main things for us, certainly as women nowadays, um, what we struggle with and what I struggle with, for sure, is that they were really visually and publicly great communicators of their accomplishments and power within society. And third of all, and I think that's very apt for the current situation as we're sitting here, they were really great networkers, and networkers in the sense that women came together in a sort of a council, and other times in sort of a way of a sisterhood. And the Latin terms um, are conventus matronarum and a curia mulierum, which meant actually the last one, a senate of women, and the first one, a gathering of female participants, and I think that's exactly apt for nowadays. So let me introduce you to some of these women. And you might actually, for those who landed on Fiumicino uh, yesterday or today or in the, uh, the last days, there were statues lined up between the, how do you call it, the, the walkways, the sort of escalator ones, and there were some really amazing Roman women also portrayed there. But here we go. This is the first. She's called Fundilia, and she was from Nemi, a city a little bit, or here in the vicinity of Rome. And as you can see, she, I, I don't have a pointer, but I think I can, if, if you look at her face, it's not sort of what you think about. Uh, as a really female face. She has quite a stern expression. And Fundilia actually thought that was applicable to her situation. She was a matron in her society who had been of immense value, and she was dedicated no, not less than three statues within her society. So a lady who was well known. The second, and I will go into more detail for one of them, the second is called Minia Procula, and she was from Northern Africa, nowadays um, Tunisia. And she was, and actually I specialized in, uh, in statues and mainly the poses, this pose meant she was, she was sort of putting her hands up in a sort of praying motion. And this was actually, when you see a statue with the hands up, it means probably that she was either a priestess or that she was in a sort of a devotional pose. And actually, she was a priestess in her hometown of Bularegia in Tunisia. 
And she was also dedicated this statue by her city council for her role in her hometown. Not so shabby when you think about the limitations that they had to face. And Roman women, and I say Roman women because the Roman world included the north of Africa and the whole of the Mediterranean uh, borders actually going into um, Afghanistan um, as far east as that. So Roman women, I mean from all over the empire. So here we have Italy, Tunisia, and here we have um, a lady I call Unia um, Rustica, but actually the real Unia Rustica, her statue has been lost to us. We have inscriptions mentioning her, and we don't know who she is, but she is such a lovely, <laughs> such a lovely statue that I just show her to you and tell her it's Unia Rustica. Uh, and the beautiful thing is there is um, a way of showing how these statues actually looked because they were really colorful, just like we are as normal human beings and normal women. <laughs> so Unia Rustica, she was a force to be reckoned with. She was from Spain, and in her hometown, she not only built a bathhouse, a public bathhouse, but she built a theater. She built a lot of things, and she paid the city taxes for her whole town to Rome. Well, that's what you call power and influence. And actually, she not only was given the honor of a statue by her city senate, she actually made them also dedicate a statue to her husband and her son. And normally in Roman um, research, we tend to think that when we find a female statue, that is because she was awarded a statue for the status and accomplishments of her husband as a companion to her husband. But no, in her case, it was the other way around. And I think that's quite fascinating because it makes us realize that we need to have different lenses to look at our history and not and venture out of our normal ways of approaching things and looking at things. And lastly, there, oh, this is a close, I thought that is, it's 2,000 years ago, but th this is just a phase of nowadays as well, isn't it? <laughs> 2,000 years is, is nothing <laughs> in, the, in the span of time of the Earth. But, oh, there she goes. This, this is my favorite. This is my friend. I spent a lot of years with her. <laughs> And this is Eumachia. Eumachia, and she lived in Pompeii. And I want to use her as an example for what it was that women could achieve. And she was a very early example of one of the women who broke the mold in the early empire. Christine uh, mentioned the Roman Empire, and I'm speaking about the first century AD, or 10 years before um, the, the birth of Jesus. Well, that's not dated really correctly, so he was born in four, bef before Christ, but <laughs> let's not get into that. But she was, she was living in the last decades before the year zero and right after. And actually, when you see the forum here of Pompeii, the biggest building on the forum was this one. And she actually paid for it and dedicated it to the whole of the town. She was a public priest. She was actually the priestess of the, uh, of the, the patron deity of Pompeii, Venus Pompeiana. And she was, in her role as priestess, very visible. But also in her role of a, as a builder of this a monumental building, she would have been in contact with the city council to discuss, deliberate, get permission, and even more, she would also be on site just to see how things were going. And the thing is, she not only built this building, she also built the largest 
tomb in, Ro in the whole of Pompeii. And that was quite something, since the men of honor in the town were oftentimes given a public funeral on behalf of the city council. And there was a whole burial street for all the important men. And she didn't want to be buried there, no. She chose another burial site and built the largest tomb she could build. Massive. And not only that, there were a lot of families included in her tomb, which were probably part of her own female network and who couldn't pay for their own tombs, and she incorporated them into her own tomb. So that is Eumachia, and that is just a snippet of the women who I come to study. But what can you do with that? What do you, so how can you apply this to your own life? Well, I think there are a couple of ways. Sometimes for me, it's just to know that we have a legacy and also to know that we, when we know our history, we can build bridges. We don't only know more about ourselves, but also about our communities and others and the world, and we can bring a different energy. But sometimes it's really practical, and I think about the three learnings of my research, and I think, hmm, how am I dealing with my own limitations at the moment? How am I presenting myself visibly, publicly, Am I, actually? And how am I using my sisterhood of women? Am I using my network? Am I giving, am I relying for a bit of support? And other times, it is much more personal. It's the times when I struggle, and actually I'm, I'm tearing up right now, the times that I'm struggling, and I'm actually, this last year has been extremely difficult on a personal level, with really sad things going on. And I let them fill my shoes. I think of these women, and I realize I have inhaled a molecule or two of them. And I feel I can stand on the shoulders of giants and know my own female ancestry that will power me, that will give me courage and resilience, and will cradle me into the future. And it's like the great Maya Angelou said, I come as one, but I stand as 10,000. And I think for now we can say it's even much more than those 10,000. <laughs>